Welcome to the One Hero Podcast, where we answer Malaysians' burning questions about personal finance with fact-based answers. Arisa Networks is a California-based computer networking company. They design the routers and switches for the data centers and network communication industry. Their clients include tech giants like Microsoft and Meta. They're one of the companies that are seeing a boom in their earnings thanks to the rise of AI adaptation. The share of their uh, ANET rose 20% over a week ago thanks to a better than expected earnings growth. The question we're asking today is, should you invest in ANET? It can be exciting to join in on the AI boom, but what are we missing from the picture? Welcome back to Stock Investing from Zero on the One Hero podcast. Today, we're putting on our beginner's lenses on ANET. John, what should a beginner look at when it comes to ANET? Um, again, the most basic stuff, ask the four questions. So I'll repeat the four questions for the benefit of the audience who have not watched our Stock Investing from Zero series, which is what business are they in and how do they make money? Secondly is, are they profitable and financially stable doing it sustainably? Okay. Um, third is, who is the audience and how big can they grow? When, when I say audience, means market, lah, market size. And last but not least, are they cheap or expensive and not in terms of share price? Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, today, Louis, we take for granted a lot of the things that we use on the internet. You know, you sign up a Gmail account, 15 gigabytes for free. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Correct, correct, yeah. Yeah, and then in the days of uh, uh, past, I, I don't know even the young ones even know this, the young, Dropbox. <laughs> ah. You remember Dropbox? Yeah, yeah, Dropbox was my time, definitely. Dropbox was when I was like um 15 or 16 years old. They, they yes, not... yes, yes. Today, I don't think kids today know Dropbox. No, no. Dropbox is probably, um rather than a company, Dropbox fee is a feature now. It's yeah. a of many, many, many uh, platforms. Correct, correct. I mean, during those times when Dropbox launched, two gigabyte was like, wow, you know, it's huge, right? Today, yeah. you sign up Gmail, it's 15 gig already. It's free, mm. right? <laughs> so, um, question one, what business do they do and how do they make money? So, they are the leading provider of cloud networking solutions. Now, uh, I think uh, for most uh, audience out there who are not a techie themselves and not, um, you know, someone who likes to go into the weeds of all these things, maybe I just give a, a quick, um, you know, uh, run through or introduction about uh, what a cloud data center is and cloud networking solutions, okay? Mm. So we all know of a cloud, okay? Uh, a data center, uh, a cloud, but what powers a cloud is actually a data centers like this. So you see racks and racks of servers, equipment, networking equipment that actually li literally uh, a lot of these are filled with just hard drives. Uh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hard drives and a pro a, a probably a, a CPU, memory and all that kind of thing to actually power the, the cloud, okay? The internet, right? Now, at the back of it, you see all these independent racks. Uh. They need to talk to each other. Uh. Mm. Oh. And usually how these racks need to talk to each other, you think about it, we communicate in, in terms of speech, uh, language, body language and all that kind of thing. These guys talk in terms of bytes. But the problem is transferring data as fast as possible is not as easy as it seems. Okay, I, I give you an example. A phone wants to talk to a phone. You are limited by what? The speed of the Bluetooth connection, the speed of the Wi-Fi connection, right? Or the speed of your cellular connection, right? Mm -hmm. uh, usually we talk about what? 200 megabytes, 500 megabytes, 5G you talk about probably I don't think 5G can reach one gig, but a few hundred megabytes, right? I don't, I'm not sure. I can't remember the standard for 5G. 5G speeds. Oh, okay. 5G is potential. Okay, 10 to 20 gigabytes. Okay, 100 times faster. Okay, so I was mistaken. So even this is still considered slow because uh, the biggest fear for any uh, uh, communication is actually this thing called latency. Mm. The longer The longer you wait, between that one, uh, then the, the latency is high. Lah. So just imagine you want to access your file on Google Cloud or Google Drive, right? And you double click, you're expecting it to happen within seconds, right? Yeah. So can you imagine uh, if this one happens within seconds, right? The communication between the server racks has to happen between in microseconds or nanoseconds or picoseconds, right? Right. 
right? And and that means it's like very, very low latency and very, very fast, right? And very, very reliable. So Arista Network's job is literally to do this. Okay. At the back of all these racks, there's actually communication routers or switches. You look at all this cable, this spaghetti. So I think this is uh, one that, uh, where was one that looks the best? Okay, something like this. Ah, here you go. You see this? So all these cables will allow all these server racks to actually talk to each other. And then it goes out one main, probably a fi most likely a fiber backbone. I don't think they use copper for these kind of places. Definitely a fiber backbone. And go out all the way to us. And then it spreads out to all our different residential offices, commercial uh, areas. Huh? So they make the switches that make these guys talk to each other. So I don't know, Louis, is that simplified enough for most of the audience? Yeah, yeah, I think I think um that's, that's very clear. Um but I think regards to latency, probably in layman terms, people would say lagging la. Yes, all right. We can you say lagging. Lagging. Uh, if if let's say you 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 open something, imagine if you were on Facebook and you click something, it took two seconds instead yeah. of like microseconds to switch, right? You yes. would just hop off the the um uh platform. Another, right. I think, I think, uh, with regards to Arista, is also related to all those AI chat GPT. Imagine all if right. you chat to chat GPT, right, and then like it took them like five seconds to reply. <laughs> <laughs> totally ruined the feeling of AI. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It ruins the feeling as if you're talking to someone. Uh, right? uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The lag, I think, the lag really is a Turing effect, right? Yes. So, so the the the, the longer that it has to wait hesitation and all that all oh, you will realize oh actually it is a computer that's and right that away the magic of ai I feel it's like. gone it's the yeah. allure of ai allure, is gone. Allure. So <laughs> yeah. in, 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 in the internet age this is very important la. low that's, latency yeah. that's right that's right so oh, this is how an arista network switch looks like okay oh that's the, that was just the thumbnail yeah so you've got they don't just make the switches so yeah. i think one key thing that i think they differentiate uh, between the other competitors as well is actually they provide a um, one-stop center, a cloud solution, cloud computing solution. Uh. So, so they do like, uh, let's say, preventive maintenance. Uh, they have, let's say, diagnostic tools to see whether part of the network is slower, faster, or that kind of thing. Uh. And I think that is one thing that helps them stand out a little bit. I'm not saying the other guys, the competitors, once we come to the market, we'll talk about the competitors as well. But yeah, this is uh, something very, very behind the scenes that most people don't realize. It's a, it's a thing of it. It's like the guy providing you water. We only know our water by opening the tap. Yeah. We only know our internet by like the turning on the phone or turning off the, you know. Some people don't even know where the router is at home <laughs> or the switch is right you just go oh, wi-fi right then what's the password right that's it right when the thing goes wrong just call pm or yeah just call pm or, or, or come and time. check yeah no the, the funniest thing is there's one time i was while well, i was waiting for uh them to reset my the the local switch on my condo i was chatting with the customer service uh, technical service person and i said why do you make us follow all these steps? Huh? Because some, he's, they, they replied me, sometimes they don't even know that you can recite the router. <laughs> a lot of oh. clients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First step. Because I, I already done all that, you know. And, and I, I actually tried to ping the thing. So local, I could ping. But it was actually the, the network connection outside. So they were like still asking me to go through the basics because they said a lot of people don't know that you could reset the router and all that kind of thing. Lah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, shall we move on to the next question, Louis? Yep, yep. I think I think it's quite clear. So they provide these um, uh, switches and routers. I think I think I also want to add a point here. Is mm. also specifically for AI. Mm -hmm. The purpose of AI is is also one of the the big applications that brings them to the spotlight today. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. You see here. You see here. Product right. They even have uh, solutions. They have AI networking specifically mm. for AI. So they, they are betting big on AI. Oh, definitely. Like, yeah. Definitely. I mean, like, uh, you look at this. I think uh, 
if you want to go geeky and all this, just go to the Aristan.com and watch the videos. I'm I pretty think for sure. the IT incline, this is this is something of a treat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, they're, they're in uh, they go Legoland Eco Valley. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. I think it's quite interesting. It's just uh, so so technical for me. I'm not. Yeah, in yeah, yeah. So. Think of it this way uh for those that just want the investor lens beginner beginner lens they make uh network solutions i don't want to say hardware because they also have the software solutions like diagnostic tools they make the the network solutions for uh cloud companies cloud-based companies ai-based companies and um yeah they, they do so by either charging a one-off for the hardware but also a recurring revenue for the subscription for all their services, software services as well, diagnostic too. Okay. Mm. Are they profitable? That's the next question we want to answer. So again, we go back to ticker and we type in Arista works. Okay. We go into detailed financials. Okay, let me just plot out this thing. Look at that, Louis. So beautiful. Cool. <laughs> Outward sloppy curve. I almost okay. like my heart almost jumped up. <laughs> okay. Uh, net income, okay, uh, there was a bad year during 2020, but that's forgivable because it's COVID. Operating cash flow, okay, let me set all the labels. And last but not least, return on invested capital. Wow, it's pretty high. Okay, so what I, what I, just, I, I just plotted. Um, the blue column bar is actually the sales. So in 2016, they had 1.2 billion in sales and they had about 184 million in net income and 174 in operating cash flow, which is good. Which means that whatever net profit they have, that they have booked, they've actually realized most of it in cash rather than a deferred oh, payment. Okay. okay? Wow. That means their uh, uh, aging receivables is not, not that high, right? They have money in the bank. Lah, basically. They literally have money in the bank. Okay. So going all the way till. 2022 December financial year end. Let's look at the revenue. Okay, 4.38. So remember 1.1 and 4.38. So they've actually uh, quadrupled their sales in a span of 2016 to six years. Okay, uh, profit has it jumped 184 to wow? They almost ten times their profit. <laughs> oh, 184 million to 1.32 billion, almost ten times, eight times, nine times. Okay. And the operating cash flow also grew. This was 174. This was 492. Okay. They probably have uh, quite a lot of receivables that they need to collect. Lah. 492 uh, million in terms of cash flow from operations. So the last line, and this is actually a very critical uh, business operation efficiency metrics, is what I call the return on invested capital. Now, what, what, does it, what does that mean? It means for every dollar you put into growing the business, how much are you going to get back in return? Now, we look at these numbers. We look, wow, 20% normal. Huh? Just to let you know, Louis, 80% of businesses around the world, or 90%, I would say, don't make 20% on ROIC. Hmm. I think especially at this size, right? Yes, at this size. Usually, it's only the, out, I call it the outliers, uh, people like the oh. Googles, the Amazons, the Microsoft and all that. It's very, very difficult to get a return on invested capital of 20%. You go and ask most of your business friends, uh, SME or whatever, they'll be lucky to make 7 8% return on invested okay. capital. So that means every dollar you put in, you get 80 cents back. Lah. No, less. 8 cents back, actually. Right? Uh, there's one company, though, I've not looked at the numbers quite recently. Uh, I think Apple does about 50%. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's quite crazy. Yeah, we, yeah. We, did, we did see yeah. that earlier. One of the episodes, yeah. Correct, correct. So, next question. Who is their audience and how big can they grow? Obviously, uh, when you think about cloud, when you think about AI, you think about people like Google, people like uh, Microsoft, people like um, Facebook. Facebook is also, you know, running their AI bots. Mm -hmm. Any large uh, cloud-based social media, I think even Instagram and all that, as long as there's an AI engine, large language model behind the scenes, I'm very sure they will deploy either an Arista network solution or one of their competitors like Cisco. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think I read, I read that for Arista specifically, uh -huh. Meta and Microsoft actually makes up about half of 
their revenues already. Wow, yeah, yeah. I'm not surprised. Uh. I mean, these two companies. Yeah, just chat GPT alone mm. is already a big chunk of what is powering the AI today. I mean, there's Google. Google may want to use their own. <clears throat> I don't know whether Google makes their own network switches. I could be mistaken. But they have their own BART equivalent to fight against chat GPT. So sooner or later, they will have to have a networking, AI networking solution as well. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah. Uh, we've... While we know the, what do you call it, the Facebooks and the Microsoft, uh, Meta, I keep on saying Facebook, Meta and Microsoft, thanks for sharing that. We also must not forget about government agencies, mm. telecommunication service providers, entertainment companies, uh, financial services. So those guys that, you know, your main banks, okay, in Malaysia, your main banks of this world, your CIMB, whenever you go online banking, right? I'm pretty sure now everybody wants to add some AI element to it. Uh, these yeah. are the guys that could be potential customers for Arista Network as well. And I think I think we also have to think about how um, their uh, potential customer base are also kind of indirect sometimes. Correct. I think they probably are operating at an enterprise level, it seems like. That's, that's right. But then um, as the user pays for their customers grow, right? The needs for uh, the the need for their networks will also increase at the same time. And I think there's for me, I'm I think there's no stopping AI from growing bigger and bigger over time, la. Most definitely, right. most definitely. Like yeah. I also shared with you yesterday. Um, I'm in e-commerce, so Shopify. Um, I saw them like last week they launched something called Sidekick. So it's like a merchant like, assistant thing, you know. Mm. So. I can see like more even with this adaptation those uh anything that's powering that will also grow yeah yeah i'm just trying to plot out shopify's numbers okay another <laughs> another hyperbolic curve we should, we, should, we should do that to do the next episode yeah and then do the next episode yeah but it would so be very can, interesting like, to see you, you know, can shopify see in detail and i can also share with you some what, of what i see yeah 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 so they, they are a big adapter of ai Compared to a lot of other e-commerce platforms, Shopify is one of the fastest and um, probably most in-depth adapter of uh, AI in yeah. the merchant network. Yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah, I. You know, Mr. Beast actually promotes Shopify. Oh, I didn't know. He sponsored. That, yeah. yeah, I didn't know. I was like Ooh. randomly browsing yesterday, and one of Mr. F uh, F uh, Beast's uh, feed video came out. Uh, he mm -hmm. was doing a seven-day challenge in the ocean, and in the middle of it, he was doing he. Oh, he the was Shopify. Actually, yeah, so, he was just promoting Shopify. So, so what comes to mind is like, well, how much money Shopify has to 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 do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. These promotions are quite expensive, I would think. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. So I think the sky's the limit, and the best part about it is, I think we are only touching the we were only at the nascent stage of AI. Mm. Um, like whatever cloud centers, data solutions that we, some of these were built twenty years ago. And the reason why um, I, I, I always assume a lot of these were new, but then I look back, a lot of the cloud centers, the legacy cloud data centers or off-prem data centers, discover, uh, disaster recovery centers, these were built probably 30, 40 years ago, you know. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think about it, yeah, maybe even, <coughs> excuse me, uh, at best 20 years ago, mm. and why, why I even came to, to, that conclusion was there's a very famous guy louis called jim chanos he is actually one of the world's uh well-renowned market shorters he actually shorts company for a living that means uh they buy with the hopes that they can actually make money on the way down rather than on the way yeah. up okay and he's famous for shorting enron and worldcom Mm. Okay. And uh, yeah, he's a legend. He's a god. He, they call him the Godfather. Famous of company. Yeah. Yes, yes. And uh, he started shorting data centers, legacy okay. data centers. Ooh, okay, interesting. Yeah, because obviously I won't go into the detail. I will not be able to articulate as, it as well as him. Uh, but long to short of it is that a lot of these legacy data centers, the cost to acquire a customer is more than the cost to run the business. Mm. because a lot of these are not what we call you have to differentiate uh, data centers are not all data centers are profitable usually the ones that are doing very very well are what we call hyperscalers mm. <laughs> so the hyperscalers will include people like the metas the googles and all that but he's talking about the old legacy data centers 
And those are the ones that are suffering in terms of profitability, uh, demand and all that kind of thing. And he's shorting these companies. Uh. So then I realized, wow, okay, there's actually legacy data centers. We all thought that this is all new and nice yeah. and dandy and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Right? yeah. So that's what we see on Google. Right? That's right. That's right. Again, yeah. he headline news can be very, very, very de deceiving. Uh. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, who is the audience? As I think, uh, Louis, you've mentioned, um, Meta and Microsoft takes up half of their revenue. I think the rest is made up by internet companies, uh, service IS service providers, financial services organization, government agencies, media and entertainment, uh, telecommunication services, and others. Uh, so don't forget they excuse me. They may not just market the product on their own, but they actually market it through other distributors and systems integrator as well. So maybe they will go to a telecom Malaysia and say, hey, okay, can you be my service provider for this region or whatever? So instead of them knocking on doors to sell, uh, they get like a, a internet service provider or a telco company to actually market the solutions. Or they may have a separate niche uh, contractor that says, hey, I only do AI switches. And then to any hyperscalers that want to re relocate into Asia or Singapore or whatever, uh, you guys go and do the solution for me, rather than them flying an engineer from the US all the way here to, to do it. Yeah. Makes sense, makes sense. Yeah. Um, why I think, what I think will be the catalyst, I think uh, more and more AI adoption, uh, we, we think only about chat GPT in terms of AI, but there's uh, so many other applications, like you mentioned Shopify. Uh, consumer behavior on Shopify, you know, the merchants will, will, will love this kind of thing. So once they include all these kind of things, even Notion, you know, the tool that we use quite frequently, Notion, Notion already has a built-in AI function. Mm. So all that actually needs something to power the communications in between. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if any anyone uh, these days, I think as long as you have a have a, have a mobile phone, mm. it's, it's hard not to actually touch AI Correct. at any point during the day. Actually, Correct. I think everyone will get in touch with AI as long as you have internet and the phone. That's <laughs> right. Really going to use AI in one, one form or another. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a bit scary because like, you know, there are times mm -hmm. whenever I have a meeting and I have my phone next to me, an iPhone, uh, my Siri will wake up. So it's like, I better make sure like uh, <laughs> whatever you say is is recorded or li someone's listening somewhere, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm very scary. sure. I'm very yeah. sure that, that, that we're living in that very, very big brother era. Correct, correct, correct. So uh, next, I think when we look at the uh, valuations, are they cheap or expensive? Um, right now, I think uh, they're going at a, let's see, a forward PE of about, no, this is trailing or forward? Oh, this next 12 months is forward, okay. And then trailing PE is... Okay, if you look at the trailing PE, it's roughly about 30, 34, 35 times, 32 times, sorry, 33 times. And then for forward PE, meaning what do the analysts expect or what do the market uh, expect them to, to make will actually lower the PE. Because if they, if they make more profit, that means your earnings uh, will be higher uh, tomorrow and benchmark against the price today. You're buying them for a forward PE of about 27, 28 times up. Uh, which I think it's kind of reasonable, to be honest, for a company of such high quality. One thing I forgot to do, though, uh, Louis, was check their balance sheet. <laughs> we looked at the cash. Don't carry it away. Carry it away. Yeah. So cash and equivalent. Let me clear this graph first. Huh? Okay. So cash and equivalent. Okay. I look at usually this thing called total cash and short-term investment. It's about $3 billion. Okay. And then I look at total liabilities. Oh my God, net cash company. <laughs> so cash and short-term investments are what are, what are instruments or assets that you can redeem in a very short span of time. Okay. And you can get <clears throat> 3 billion. Okay. And what they owe other people is only 1.8 billion in totality, which includes suppliers, I think. Usually total liabilities includes how much you owe the suppliers, which is total payable. The biggest chunk is actually what? Uh, unearned revenue current. Oh, that means this is uh, money they just need to collect. <laughs> wow. Long-term debt, uh... non-existing. Okay. Uh, unearned current, non-revenue. Okay. Unearned is so clean. 
Yeah, it's so clean. It's a very clean balance sheet. Uh, let me see. Uh, common stock. Okay, they've not added much. I think they added in 2020. Uh, more, I think, for the shareholders, which is good. But it's, it's stagnant. Uh, I We wouldn't go deep into things like stock-based compensation and all that. I think it's a little bit too deep. But mm -hmm. at the moment, I look at it, it's a very nice balance sheet. Now, you see, you see this thing that says net debt? So net debt, if it's red, means it's in net cash. Ah. Mm. If it's if black, means it's, it's uh, whatever they owe is whatever uh, is more than whatever they have in cash and equivalent. Yeah, so yeah, very clean balance sheet. Lah. So valuation-wise, we've covered. So I repeat again, probably the four questions uh, to recap. Uh, what business are they in and what do they do to make money, which is the network switches and solutions? Are they profitable, financially stable? Absolutely. Uh, what's the audience? It's huge. You think of any 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 company or any government agency that runs AI, they're, they're, they're the potential customer. And are they cheap or expensive, Louis? 33 times trailing, 27 times forward. I think it's pretty reasonable from my point of view. Yeah. I'm mm. pretty sure you've got other things to share on in terms of ownership. Maybe you take us through that, Louis. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I think I'm just like quite impressed with this given that you know I'm not I'm not I'm not an investor per se like John, but we have gone through a lot of these episodes and I've hardly come across such a clean balance sheet where John is quite happy with a lot of the numbers we see yeah. here. So I yeah. think that's a very positive sign. Yeah. Um so my questions would be like during my research around um Arista is that one of the highlights was um that they have a large chunk of institutional um ownership actually. Mm. Yeah. About like fifty one percent yeah. owned by just twelve investors, which and then is very very high, very high, and then another ninety percent actually held by insiders, right? So, in fact, retail investors only make up about twelve percent. Yeah, is is that a big concern? <laughs> should we be concerned? How much should should this kind of like ownership weigh in on, uh, our decision to invest? Actually. There's always two sides of the coin, Louis, and I think it's a mm. fantastic question. Okay. The beauty of having um okay, let's let's take the context back. Uh, I dial it back one thing, uh one one round uh, so that you uh, understand the context of where I'm looking at it from. Okay, so um I can't remember who were, oh okay, yes. I I interviewed this uh the chief strategy officer for Yinsen last week. So the podcast may drop anytime soon on uh, my channel. But the conversation came about because EPF is their second largest shareholder. Okay. Um, and EPF used to be more of a passive manager in the sense that when they buy a block, uh, they will leave you to run your business. They may uh, include um, board members on the seat. They may put, especially if the investment is very, very big, they may include their officers as board members of, of, of these companies. But what they are seeing now, Yinsen is seeing today, is that EPF is taking more of an activist investor stand. Mm. So what do you mean by activist investor? If you're not doing right, they'll bank table and say, nope, I will use my voting power to actually block all this. <clears throat> so the point I'm trying to make is that when you have institutional investors, this kind of governance is actually very, very high. I'm not saying all, but majority of the time when you have institutional investors, people like Vanguard, people like BlackRock, uh, they are safeguarding their, their shareholders as well. And because of that, in terms of governance, you would expect a higher standard. Because if let's just say your, your company is 60% owned by retailers who are not sophisticated, who don't understand corporate governance processes, procedures, and all that kind of thing, they don't know what to demand. Mm. But when you have huge uh, institutions like this, that's where the governance standard is expected to be higher. Okay. The con is this. Let's just say you mentioned 51% uh, is held by either insiders or large organizations or, or large funds, right? The moment they pull out, wow, I tell you the price, uh, <laughs> it's going to be boom. Because it's such a big block. Okay? Mm. Such a big block. And for them, they also struggle to sell because they cannot sell one shot. They know that the moment they sell one shot, right, is really going to like write down a lot of the, the, the share price. Are. So I'm not saying either way is bad or good. The pro is that when you have a lot of insiders, you have skin in the game, institutional guys, you have uh, high corporate governance. 
In terms of retail, the advantage would be if they pull, you have very many, many small chunks that pull rather than one big block that actually pulls out. Lah. So I hope I answered your question, Louis. Yeah, yeah, just to just I mean I mean that that's um yeah the pros and cons the pros seems but at the same time um you know they what what these institutional investors are safeguarding is in the end the interest of these like they are shareholders, right? That's right, you know, that's, right. Exactly, that's right. Like the retail investors um interest, right? Whatever like makes them feel like okay, it's time for us to pull up, mm. you know, and affect everyone. But at the same time, does it really matter? If let's say on in the in the long term, um, you know, we, we have like very good profits, etc. Will it like just balance things out? Or let's say like a few. So we have 12 um, large investors, right? So let's say three pulls out. Mm. Will it impact the, the stocks? Uh, um, I think temporarily it will, definitely, if three pulls out simultaneously. But I think more importantly, what you mentioned is the insiders insiders and institutionals are different institutionals i still consider them outsiders because they may um, uh, they may or may not run uh the operations of the company most of the time they don't okay, okay. Uh, so when i say in when you mentioned insiders i think that's where uh the people like the bash toast i don't even know how to pronounce this back to scheme back to scheme <laughs> the first guy here yeah back to Back to Shim, back to right. Shim yeah. it's, a, it's a German, it's a yeah, um, very interesting background. Um, German and then came to US, uh, co founder of Sun Microsystems. I went to dig a little bit about their history. Oh my god, this guy's a serial entrepreneur. They were the first two inv institutional investors of uh, Google when they invested, wow. they gave Larry, Larry Patch, and Sergey Brin a hundred thousand check. Okay. The company was not yet even incorporated. Google was not even incorporated yet. They already gave them a hundred thousand check. Yeah. So this guy wow. is like a serial entrepreneur, really knows his stuff. Uh, I think with him backing the company and such a big stake. Uh, by the way, his his net worth is worth seven billion. Uh, Andy himself. Andy Beck. Yeah. Beckosh. I have to find a way how to pronounce his name. Back back to yeah, Google. Google. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll definitely go and do that later. Company and <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so I consider insiders as people who either co-founded, still running the company, and then institutional investors are people like the Vanguard, the Black Rocks. Wow, even this one, uh, Irrevocable Trust. Uh, wow, nice. I'm pretty sure this guy is also uh, probably one of the co-founders, Ule Jayashi. I've not read about him. <clears throat> Individual investor. Oh, that's a lady. Ah. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Ula... The founder is a lady, yeah. Ula Jeshiri. Ah, nice. She's British American. Wow. CEO of Arista Networks. Okay. So you see, this 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 is the I think <clears throat> no matter what we say about the US economy and I know people like pro China and all that kind of thing. I think US is just very, very special to me. Lah. I mean, the first time I went there in 2013 as an adult, um, I I fell in love. I already fell in love the the country before I even even went there, lah. You know, we will watch their mainstream media. Obviously, it's quite different mainstream media what we watch on the movies versus when you go there. But I think the power of their economy, the capitalist system, is not perfect, but I think it actually allows things like this to happen, right? It allowed Tesla to happen. You know, Elon Musk was South African. Why on earth did he uproot himself and go to California and build his first gigafactory in Fremont mm -hmm. in California? One of the most expensive states in the world to actually run a business. Probably the, I think I think the US is probably the most business-friendly country in the world. Like yeah, exactly, exactly. I have a few friends from uh, my childhood who actually went to the US study in Harvard then uh, create, uh, started a few AI startups too. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah. You, you you don't see that in China. You don't see that in India, right? I mean, it's 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 something that uh, <clears throat> they allow you to go there. Uh, uh, you, you have honest, you uh, you do honest hard work, and then you you're given a chance, and that that's it, you know. So yeah, yeah. so you probably you, I, I'm pretty sure Louis, uh, the audience out there will be probably wondering uh between this and you know the latest ai craze which is nvidia <laughs> right 
yeah, uh, yeah, we cover NVIDIA too. So I'm also going to link that in the description for those who are curious, but that was quite uh, some time ago. Correct, like, right, correct, correct. Yeah. So you think of NVIDIA as the guy making the chip. Uh, NVIDIA actually makes their own communication solutions also, you know, Louis. I, I well, didn't, I think I the price actually went up a bit more, right? Yeah, like, it's like, you look at the vertical. Talked about it. Oh my gosh. You look at this, it's like... <laughs> We talked about it somewhere in April or something. I think it was right? like 300 something back then. Yeah, right? yeah. And it's still going oh, up at a PE of 232. Oh, <laughs> wow. okay. It's crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I think, put it this way, I think everyone in the ecosystem um, will benefit because uh, the tailwind is behind them. Um, and more importantly is this stuff. We have taken the internet, uh, cloud, AI uh, for granted. It becomes ubiquitous. But the infrastructure behind it still needs a lot of catch-up. Uh, uh, I mean, we, we live in a Malaysia. Actually, Malaysia, uh, in terms of internet connectivity, we're not bad, you know, seriously. Comparatively to countries it's like it's Cambodia. Quite, it's quite fast. It's just not very stable. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. And I think we are already blessed to be able to like okay. leverage uh, on. I, I take yeah, certain for things for sure. granted. For sure. Yeah, yeah. I take certain things for granted. Like I have a five hundred megabyte connection at home, and I'm like, whenever I see some, I go somewhere, and I'm. It's like I see a download speed of twenty, right? I, I cringe. <laughs> 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 I cringe because it's like this is not acceptable. <laughs> correct, correct. Actually, it is very slow, you know, given the, the file sizes that we need to download these days. Correct. We expect like um even a one gigabyte thing to be downloaded in a few seconds these days, I feel like. Yeah. That's right, that's right, yeah. that's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think uh, to conclude. Yeah, sorry, I have a few more questions about oh, please, it. please, go ahead. Like, yeah. You know, um, Arista. So like we, we see that Arista, um, you know, P is actually about eight times less, uh, right? Is which it, one, sorry, P, uh, PE, uh, trailing PE or forward PE? Yeah, the trailing one. It's 30, 36 <clears throat> or 33, right? Yeah, 33 to 27, ah, okay. uh, five yeah. times, uh, about five times less. Uh. Oh, five, five okay. Five yeah. multiples less, yeah. Yeah, so so um, given these choices, are there like, can, can we say that, okay, in fact, a, a net is cheaper. Can we say that? Or, or is there like other, like, less quantitative things that we need to consider before okay we, okay i think um it goes back to question three which is how big is the audience and how uh, who's the audience and how big can it grow so we always look at total addressable market it's not a precise number don't get me wrong huh? it's not mm. precise science but because you ask it's like what are what are some of the back of envelope kind of things that we should yeah, look at yeah. whether it's, it's expensive or it's cheap <clears throat> normally for me, right, I, I try to keep things simple. Like, there are some guys who like are a diamond. You have to build your financial model. That means you have to build a discounted uh, cash flow, whatever, and you run right, it to the T, right. lah. Virtually, you have to put in your wow. discount rate, your terminal. And you run less like super complicated spreadsheet, right? So you look, it will look something like this, lah. Like the analyst estimate, right? You have to tweak all these figures, lah. Gross margins, lah. What you expect their margins to be right? What you expect the tax rates to be like? How much are they going to spend in capital expenditure? <clears throat> Virtually, you can build a model. You, you can go weeks or even months on end just to build the perfect model, uh, right? But for me, I always look at this. Uh, this management, they are not dumb. They don't run the company based on a spreadsheet, okay? Uh, they obviously know what's the market size. We just need to kind of guess what the market size really is. And then we make an assumption that they take, let's say, 10%, 20% of the market share. And in the meantime, what we try to do is that, okay, if it's 10% of the market share, then you work backwards to how big can your sales actually grow if it's 10% of the market share. You get what I mean? Let's just say the entire market is 100 billion. Okay, 10% would be 10 billion. No? And from there, we look at where Arista is. Let's say today they are 4, right? 4 billion in terms of sales. So that means for them to grow to, to capture 10% of the market, there's another 6 billion left to go. You get what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And from, from there, that's how I kind of gauge, ah, okay, there's still headroom to grow, okay? Mm -hmm. Obviously, some brick bats, some more expert guys will come and they say, hey, John, you can't do this kind of back envelope, you need the more. I mean, to each his own, all right? To each his own. But if you ask me how do I determine whether it's cheap or expensive is 
One is just a very quick relative PE valuation. Am I buying it too expensive or too cheap? Is the balance sheet very clean? Because if the balance sheet is not that clean, I wouldn't just defer just to the PE, you know. But the balance sheet is yeah. clean. Then it's, okay, okay. Yeah, because, it, because we we have the that as like our baseline, right? That's have right. Like that's clean right. Balance sheet. So therefore, the number that we see at the PE is more reliable. In correct. A sense. Correct, right. correct, correct, yeah. correct, 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 correct. Now, I mean, companies like this, I know some people, they say use and you you benchmark NTA, net tangible asset against companies like this is, is, is one of the most useless things to do, lah, to be honest. Because the IP is only part of it, but how you really deliver the solutions as an integrated uh, uh, solutions and how you execute, that for me is even more important than anything else. Lah. And, and actually, a recent networks, I was surprised that it's actually quite a young company. Yeah. Very young company, right? Only That's 18 right. years compared to NVIDIA. We're seeing a few decades old company. Yes. Two or three yeah. decades old company already. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And spot on, Louis. Uh, actually, uh, last night, uh, I, I got diverted be besides researching for Arista. I actually, there was a feed that popped up about Maurice Chung. Maurice Chung is the founder of uh, TSMC. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Dr. Maurice Chang. And yeah. uh, one of his uh, favorite photos uh, is actually a photo of him and Jensen Huang. Jensen yeah. Huang is the CEO of NVIDIA. Yeah. So NVIDIA would never have gotten this far if not because of TSMC and Maurice Chang. So when you compare that in terms of relative timeline to someone like Arista, Arista had people from X Cisco. X Sun Microsystems, and then today, where it is. Can you just imagine the iteration and the morphing that has happened? So that means, right, they brought whatever was the best in Cisco practices and everything and come to Arista when they set it up and, and to grow it. It's, it's uh -huh. just, I'm just super okay, I feel like, I think, I think Jay Shi was like a, probably a very senior level person in Cisco when she founded Arista. So right. that's quite impressive to me. And within 18 years, they have bought now earnings of 1.5 billion. That's, yeah. that's really it's, a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. 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 It probably goes against all those like hypes around like, oh, young founders. Yeah. You know. It's not necessarily true. So that that's was right. quite interesting. Yeah. Okay. I think um that's about it uh, around um the uh, analysis around right, Nnet. So hopefully you guys have uh, learned something. So now we go to the next section. Sorry, John, I actually didn't. No <laughs> worry, the book, right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, the book. Yeah. The book. So um, so every time we have um, this investing um, analysis, I try to get John to recommend the book. Also, because I'm new to investing, I also want to know, and I think that the audience can benefit from it. So what's the book for today, John? The book for today, don't worry, I can like uh, spontaneously give you. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I forgot to, to tell John to do yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. But, yeah. But that, that's the best part, spontaneous, right? Spontaneous, so, yes. So this is a book by William Green. Um, it just came out quite recently. And uh, I kind of like this book because it's actually like a short biography on very, very good investors. Mm. So uh, the title of the book is Richer, Wiser, Happier. Uh, actually, in my previous startup that I used to lead, uh, I actually got each and every one of uh, the analyst team that, that helped volunteer time for Fire a copy of this book. So I bought like nine copies and I like, gave it all to the, to the research team. Um, I found this book very, very interesting because it actually contrasted the style of each individual successful investor. So they had people like uh, uh, Sir John Templeton, who is someone that I really, really admire. Uh, he's actually one of the very unique investors that actually uprooted themselves from the, the hustle and bustle of the US. He actually lived his life and investing out of the Bahamas, actually. Oh, that yeah. is quite interesting. I mean, that is quite the opposite of what people correct. do. Correct, 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 correct. Then he will talk about people like Howard Marks. He will talk about people like Nick Sleep. He will talk to people uh, like Joel Greenblatt. And he is actually friends with them. So he actually gets to interview them, ask them about their style in a more intricate manner. And I, I found the book actually very good for, especially if you want to take, uh, um, let's just say now you're you're into your intermediate uh, stage of your investing journey. You you know how to read a financial statement. 
and then uh, you know how to do some quick analysis of a company, but then you want to like find your style, your own style of investing, and you want to get some inspiration from the the giants that have come before you, right? So like there's a there's a saying I can't remember who said this. Is it? I benefited from standing on the shoulder of giants, right? So I think this book is a very good epitome of all, all that because they'll tell you, uh, especially I, I love Monish. I don't want to spoil the book too much, but uh, something like someone like Monish Prabhai. His style is virtually copying. Mm. Now we think copying in exam, you thought it was bad, right? Mm. Right? You get yeah. you get you get penalized yeah. for copying, right? But in this particular case, Monish will tell you uh copying is actually one of the best things they've ever done in his life. Copying investing. Mm. The problem is he said why why people fail even while copying, huh? Is because <laughs> they did not copy correctly. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's very interesting. Correct. It's very, so, very interesting. Correctly, in terms of, for for investing, it's quite important, right? Because like, if you only do guesswork, you think you're copying the right thing, All but right, so, the wrong answer. All right, so correct, so yeah. Well, yeah. Is it is it something like um? So it, it, I mean, like I've never read this book, but from the gist of it, it, sounds like it's also like something to motivate different kinds of investors. Precisely. I I used to think that there was one kind of investor that would, you know, be superior kind of investor where right? i used to think that so it seems like not no no even copying is, is that is that the same as copy trading then okay trading and investing i would try to put a distinction to it trading mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay, okay a lot of people think that uh uh speculation is actually a bad word actually speculating uh you can make money speculating as well Mm. You can't make money. Actually, when you're investing or you're trading, what you're doing, you're actually playing odds, mm. probabilities, okay? So, whatever you do, you are trying your best to increase your odds of winning, okay? Obviously, my chosen path is the bottoms up, digging, fundamental research, all that kind of thing, because I've seen more and more, more evidences that point towards that this method in the long run has uh, bring more brought more wealth to more people co comparatively to copy trading or to trading mm -hmm. uh, but trading you cannot say that it doesn't make money as well because trading um it does make people money the problem about copy trading is this what are you copying you're copying the entry and exit points on Ima. yeah whatever happens in between is really up to market forces so the struggle is this can you replicate the exact technique or not? That's the mm -hmm. question. Whereas as if you do value investing, when you copy, you're copying the methodology and the thinking process. That's yeah. the difference. When you're copying trading, you're copying his just entry and exit points. He can give you some rationale, some logic, whatever, but can it be replicated over and over and over and over again? Mm -hmm. So if, yeah. well, with, with this style, actually, it still needs quite a bit of like analysis right correct correct mm -hmm. correct correct and then i can tell you most successful traders actually they do a lot of fundamental research <laughs> you'll be very very surprised those macro traders whatsoever the things they read is equivalent to you doing bottoms up uh, mm. uh individual stock investing la. you get scared ma because like once you have a large chunk of money now you're okay you're scared you yeah. don't want to speculate too much, I feel like. <laughs> correct, 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 correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like Tom Gamble. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so like maybe three key takeaways from this book, John. Okay. Uh, different methods can bring uh, almost the same result in investing. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, no one style fits one person. You, you, can, you can try different, different methods all together. And third but not least, uh, there is a commonality in all the investors as well, in which they believe that uh, fundamental bottoms up value investing is still the way to go. It's just that how they tweak and twist and innovate some of these techniques, like for example, copying, uh, for example, uh, uprooting themselves from New York, the noise and bustle to go to Bahamas so that they can think quietly. The methods are just different. It's, it's very interesting to see how creative they can get to get them into the zone for the for the lack of a better word lah. Mm, mm, mm. That, that is very interesting because like um I I I knew I cannot remember who, which writer but they they actually had to um had this like house behind their house. 
right? Where where they would retire just to write for yes. a few days. For a few days. So, so they would have a main house where his family and you know the hustle and bustle was, and then he would have his own like little house behind where he would like, okay, you know, do not disturb, I will be away in yeah. the house for a bit. <laughs> Just to write. So I, I didn't know that investors also did that to, to Oh, people. a lot of investors do that oh, actually. Okay. Uh even it's Bill Gates, uh quiet time. You know, Bill Gates every year he does this retreat. He will fly into a lake, a lake house, oh. and he will actually just like uh um just read and think. Lake house, I think. Yeah, not not this one, not the Medini. There's one that um he would just fly into uh, the lake house. It's just a very basic uh, necessity place. And he will just go there and read for one or two weeks. The secretary will actually like bundle him like 20, 30 books for him to read. Cool. And then he, yeah. And then he will just take walks in the park, in, in the forest. Sounds so like a very idyllic him. life. Oh, yes, yes. And I mean, um, we don't need to go to that extreme. Lah. He will fly in his own private plane, uh, biplane, land in the lake and all that kind of thing. One day, lah, John, one day you will fly from <laughs> KL to where? <laughs> we go to Bout, Bout Lake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah very interesting. It sounds, it sounds to me like actually it's, it, it, uh, you can still make money even without like joining the hustles and bustles that we, right. we often see like in, in all those movies, right? It's all right, very, right. Yeah, very keen to read this book okay yeah. um so i think that wraps up today's episode of stock investing from zero so in fact we got this idea of covering a net from one of you our followers so we asked the question on instagram which company we should cover next and one of you suggested a net and in fact it was not on our radar so we went to take a look at it and found this company very interesting so you have if you have some uh stock ideas or stock companies that you would want to see us cover on the show, you can always uh, share that with us in the comments or drop, off a, drop us a message on one of our channels. Okay, so hopefully you have um, learned something new about ANET and that helps you with your analysis on whether you should dis, uh, decide to invest or not. So if you want to see more of these kind of company analysis, make sure to subscribe to our channel and give this video a like if you have enjoyed this content. Bye-bye.